everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today um, for our first breakout session of the conference. Um, I have Dr. Sue Robinson here with us um, to tell us a little bit more about current and future treatments uh, for chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Um, so today we welcome Dr. Sue Robinson. She is a hematologist at the Queen Elizabeth II Health Sciences Center and a professor of medicine at Dalhousie University in Nova Scotia. She's also the director of the Bleeding Disorder Clinic. Uh, her clinical and research interests include bleeding and thrombotic disorders in addition to malignant hematologic diseases such as leukemia, lymphoma, and myeloma. Dr. Robinson is the local principal investigator for a number of trials related to CLL. She's also spearheaded studies involving people with bleeding and thrombotic disorders. Thank you, Dr. Robinson, for taking the time to present on this topic with us today. We're so excited. Um, whenever you're ready, uh, it's all you. Okay, so I'm going to um, be telling you when to switch the slide, so go ahead. All right, well, thanks very much for having me here. Um, sorry, we're starting a little bit late, sorry about that. Just a few little glitches. So here are my disclosures. So with any pharmaceutical company that makes a drug that we treat CLL with, I am, uh, I have done either advisory boards or received honorarium or give uh, talks. Next. Uh, the objective, so I'm giving some background information on CLL. Um, we'll review the biology of CLL, um, review indications and considerations that will guide the treatment, um, discuss some present treatment uh, guidelines in Canada, and a little bit about future treatments. Next. So um, the background of the CLL or SLL, um, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about SLL in a few minutes. It is the most common leukemia in adults. The median age of diagnosis is 72 years. Uh, the incidence is five in 100,000 or up to five in 10,000 uh, in, uh, um, in the eighth decade or older. But we do have some young patients, so 40% are under the age of 60, 12% uh, are under the age of 50. We have almost 2,000 new cases of CLL in Canada per year. Next. So this is um, a diagram of what a bone marrow looks like. So the bone marrow is inside most of our bones and it's sort of this spongy material looks like um, maybe um, a, um, a bee's nest and inside the spaces uh, is where we make our blood cells. So there's stem cells. Those are cells that we transplant uh, patients um, in some diseases. And that's because those stem cells are the early cells in your bone marrow. They give rise to our other blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and uh, platelets. And there's different white cells. Um, the most common are the neutrophils, they fight infection. And then there's lymphocytes and CLL is a cancer of the lymphocytes. So next. So we've got on the right, um, the leukemia bone marrow, the pink is bone. And then the blue is where it's full of these lymphocytes. And then on the left is a healthy bone marrow where there's normal um, blood cells or bone marrow cells, and then um, some spaces, some fatty tissue next. So here's a normal peripheral blood. If you looked under the microscope, there's the neutrophil, um, there's the lymphocyte, and, uh, and in the background, you see lots of red blood cells and um, a little clump of platelets next. And then with, with chronic lymphocytic leukemia in the peripheral blood, you see all these mature lymphocytes. Um, sometimes you can see this pink debris that's called smear cell or smudge cell. So it's a, the debris that's, um, um, there's no longer uh, a nucleus next. So signs and symptoms of, of chronic lymphocytic leukemia typically, um, Patients don't have any symptoms, then they go and have their routine blood work done, and they're found to have an increased number of white blood cells, and then those turn out to be increased lymphocytes. 
Very common to have tiredness. You might have a lymph node swelling, um, discomfort in the left upper quadrant of your abdomen, which is where your spleen is located. Um, you may have, but you may present with increased infections, bruising, fever, night sweats, or weight loss. Next. So the diagnose, diagnostic tests, how to diagnose um, uh, CLL um, is with a blood test. So you see the high white count, you see that it's um, lymphocytes uh, that are increased. And then there's a special test we do in the blood called flow cytometry that will ad identify these lymphocytes as cancerous uh, CLL cells. There's about 5% of patients that don't have an increased white blood cell count or lymphocyte count in their blood, but they have the same cells that are in lymphocyte, uh, sorry, in lymph nodes. And they would get diagnosed um, by a lymph node biopsy. And if they don't have the cells in their blood or their bone marrow, that's called small lymphocytic le leukemia. Um, you may need a bone marrow test with CLO, but not everybody does. Um, and usually a CAT scan would be done before starting treatment next. So this is the flow cytometry, what it shows of, of the lymphocyte cells. So on the, on the left, you'll see the blue, that's a lymphocyte, that's the CLL cell or the small lymphocytic lymphoma cell. And it's identified because of these different um, markers that are on the surface. So there's CD20, um, that's where I'll talk about monoclonal antibodies, that's where they land. But we're looking for a combination of CD20, CD19, CD5, and CD23. And if they come up with that, they will tell us that these are CLL or SLL cells. Um, and over on the right, there's the diagram of the cells. Most of the time um, with CLL, the, the cells are in the bone marrow and in the blood. Um, there is also an interaction with T lymphocytes, but CLL and SLL is a disease of B lymphocytes. Um, again, if, it's if they're just occurring in, in uh, lymph nodes um, or some other cell, but not blood and bone marrow, that's called small lymphocytic um, leukemia or sorry, lymphoma. And sometimes over time, those patients, um, the, the nature of the cells can change a bit and they do start producing um, the lymphocytes in their blood and bone marrow. Next. So a physical exam. Um, that uh, the doctors would do when they're examining someone that has CLL or SLL, you look for where they have palpable, they might have palpable lymph nodes, that's typically the neck under the arms um, and down in the groin, maybe at the uh, behind the elbows and the knees. And, but normally everybody has lymph nodes throughout their body and typically we don't feel for those, but we would, um, identify them when they do have a CT scan. And in the nature of this disease, they, the lymph nodes, once they start to enlarge, they tend to enlarge at the same rate. So we don't feel it very necessary to do CAT scans uh, um, at the beginning of the diagnosis. Next. So staging of CLL, there's a couple of systems uh, systems. Rye is in North America, Binet is in uh, Europe. Um, we, so typically the, we use the Rye or Ray, Rye sense, uh, staging system. And at the stage is zero up to four. Uh, zero is just uh, the high lymphocyte count in the blood. One is uh, starting to get um, enlarged lymph nodes. Two is that the spleen or the liver or both are enlarged. Three is that the hemoglobin starts dropping and is below 100. Four is the platelets start dropping and is below 100. And, and typically stage three and four, you would be treating those patients. Um, it would be variable whether you would be treating a, a stage two. Typically we don't uh, treat stage zero or one next. Um, so there are different, um, risk scores that we look at. This one, it's the most popular one. It's CLL, the International Prognostic Index Score. It looks at age, stage, 
um, something I'll talk about in a minute, um, the immunoglobulin heavy chain variable region, <laughs> a mouthful IGHV mutational status, um, presence of a TP53 that I'll talk about, and beta-2 microglobulin is a protein that can be produced by the CLL cells. Next. So this is uh, going back to um, the cell and the flow cytometry. Um, so I didn't mention there's a structure here. It's called the B cell receptor. And um, you'll see the Y shape. And uh, typically that um, there'll be different proteins. They're called antigens that float in the blood and they will bind to this protein and activate the cell. Um, so we'll go to the next one. So this is just an enlargement of that uh, receptor, that immunoglobulin or B cell receptor. And um, it's made up of light chains here and heavy chains. Um, and, uh, and then most of, the, um, of these structures are, they're called constant regions. They never change. But at the very end, the part that's further away from the membrane of the cell, they're called variable regions, and that's because they're more susceptible to go under mutations. And so um, normally the, um, uh, the cell is unmutated and it tends to um, make that CLL cell live longer um, and reproduce more. And it can go under uh, a mutation. And if that's called an IGHB mutation, mutational status, um, uh, that is mutated. And if that's the case, it's less reactive. Um, and that's a good thing to be less reactive. So we usually say um, unmutated is a higher risk. It gives us some guidance to what treatment to use. Um, and mutated is um, better and gives us further guidance what, to, what drugs to use. Next. So here's just uh, um, a cartoon of a CLL cell, pretty complicated. But going over, here's the immunoglobulin, that B cell receptor. And um, when it uh, binds to this antigen, it starts re um, causing a reaction of different enzymes that are in the cell. And um, here's some examples. There's sick BTK, uh, PI3K. So these will then activate um, different pathways in the cell that lead to the CLL cell surviving longer, um, and the CLL cell dividing and proliferating. Also, um, an important area in the cell is the mitochondria, or where this is where the energy of the cell is. And on the surface, there's all the other proteins that are BCL um, proteins. This one's BCL2, and that's upregulated in CLL cells. So um, it also leads to the, C the CLL cell surviving and dividing, which is what we don't want. Next. Um, so this is talking about um, the cytogenetics in CLL. So here's the CLL cell. Here's the nucleus. And inside the nucleus is the genetic material. It's all lined up on structures called chromosomes. Next. So in, for everybody, um, we've got chromosomes in our cells. This is our genetic material. It determines our eye color, hair color, and um, everything about our physical features. So um, every chromosome has two parts and it, it's named um, by numbers. So there's one to 22. And so that's, um, there's 44 chromosomes there. And then there's two more, and this is, these are the um, sex chromosomes. So XX for female and XY for male. So the important ones in CLL that we wanna look at is uh, 11, 12, 13, and 17, next. Um, so the majority of patients who are over 50% will have a 13Q deletion. So that means that on the 13th chromosome will have a piece missing. Um, a lesser amount, 16% um, will have extra um, chromosome 12. Uh, some will have 18% will have uh, part of the 11th chromosome missing. And 17P is very important because this definitely guides 
our treatment. Um, and that uh, um, is about 7%. We'll have 17P deletion. Some are normal. Next. So this is just outlining 17P deletion and that other protein that I talked about that's a risk factor called TP53. So um, here's a normal um, 17 chromosome. So there's two of them. Um, there's a long arm and a short arm of every chromosome, Q and P. So the short arm is P. Um, next, you'll see that um, of, of um, chromosome 17, the, the P is missing. So that's called deletion 17P. Um, and then you'll see in the box that um, part of the genetic material on 17P is this um, gene called TP53. And what we know is that if that's mutated, that is uh, a risk factor for a number of cancers and also including CLL. So the majority of times, these two go hand in hand, 17P deletion, and TP53, but you can have one without the other next. So CLL patients requiring treatment, approximately two thirds will require treatment at some point. Um, most of those won't be treated right off the bat. Most of them, um, they, we will have a period of time and often it's years where we watch and wait. CLL is not curable except um, there is a chance of cure in someone who is young and has multiply relapsed disease and is considered for a stem cell transplant. That is, is a potential for cure, but most people do not have a disease that, that is curable. Um, but the treatments are improving survival and giving prolonged remissions. And it's probably one of the cancers that has most research going on right now. It's, it's just amazing. Um, once the treatment starts, the aim is to control the disease, minimize toxicities, and maintain a good quality of life. Next. So watch and wait. It can be difficult. Um, it's hard to live with cancer and not be treated. You figure if you're going to go see a hematologist, you'd better start treatment right away. And this is usually not what we tell you. Other people often don't believe you've got something wrong with you because you'll look great. Uh, but often you don't feel 100%, especially um, the, the fatigue is so common. Um, you can have fluctu fluctuating lymph nodes, which is disturbing, especially with fly bites um, in the warm weather, or if you've got any inflammation or infection, the lymph nodes can come, come up and down. The white cell count also fluctuates. The number of lymphocytes in your blood will go up and down. It can do that spontaneously or go up with inflammation or infection. Studies have shown that early treatment does not improve survival. So we don't um, treat until the disease is, is more advanced. Next. So there are indications for when to treat. They're, they're well spelled out, um, most recently published in 2018. So it's, um, you know, it's the blood cell count of the hemoglobin and platelets if they're progressing. Um, if the spleen is big and getting bigger, um, the lymph nodes are big and getting bigger disease symptoms. And with the latest update, they did add fatigue as a potential uh, symptom for treatment. Um, you can get um, immune proteins that can cause low hemoglobin and platelets. In that case, often we aren't treating the CLL, we're using other immune treatments, but if they don't work, we'll then treat the CLL. Um, and sometimes the CLL affects other organs in your body and um, it, that might be the reason to treat and that's less common. There might be a skin infiltration uh, or other, um, other organ that The usual course for patients who do require treatment is the vast majority, um, almost 100% will get a good response, either a complete or partial remission, usually lasts for at least a few years. Um, we can get some idea what to expect with those risk factors that I talked about, but everyone is different. Uh, then the CLL will re relapse, often slowly with the white count starting to go up again. 
And usually it's back to watch and wait. And that could again be a matter of years and then another treatment. Next. Um, considerations when choosing treatment. So those risk factors that I talked about, fitness, age, and the patient priorities. Um, in these days of COVID, uh, the priorities might be a little bit different, right? So fitness, so this is a picture of a 75 year old in both. Um, you can see they're quite different. So the age alone isn't gonna be uh, the only guide. So we look at their performance status. That's ECOG uh, for most of the doctors when we take a blood pressure, we take a pulse and we state an ECOG status. If there's a number of um, diseases, high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, there is a scoring system, it's called the Sears score. Um, and if it's six or higher, that means you're unfit. Um, kidney function, if it's good, um, you're fit. If it's not good, you're unfit. There are some indexes that look at frailty um, and judging how a person walks in the room um, or if they have to come with a walker or a wheelchair. And, and lots of um, the doctors that treat CLL will just, um, go by the ECOG status, this, um, the comorbidities, kidneys, and their, their feel after talking to the patient and watching the patient, how they, how they uh, would manage with treatment next. So treatment of CLO, we've got the chemotherapy, that's our standard treatment for cancers, oral or intravenous, and it uh, is killing this, any cells that are rapidly growing, most of the side effects are due to the damage of normal cells like hair loss, nausea, um, suppressing the bone marrow. The monoclonal antibodies we use for CLL, we use them for a lot of um, autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, um, psoriasis, they're uh, typically intravenous or subcutaneous. Um, and they, uh, the ones we have for CLL are anti-CD20, um, rituximab or obinutuzumab, and they bind to that CD20 on the cell surface. The most common side effect with them is an infusion reaction with the first exposure. That's not the majority, but it is a unique um, side effect, and usually it's managed with antihistamines, and then typically they don't get it again next. The targeted therapies are the new ones. These are the oral drugs that target those enzymes that I talked about inside the CLL cell and uh, block those um, pathways that lead to the cell um, surviving and, and um, reproducing. So the side effects from the drugs are usually due to targeting these proteins which exist in other cells. Next. History of treatment of CLL, so chemotherapy, we had chlorambucil first in the 50s, um, then in 2000, fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, then bendamustine. The monoclonal antibodies, rituximab and obinutuzumab came soon after. Targeted therapies, um, 2013 first um, publications on ibrutinib um, and idelalisib. Um, we'll talk more about ibrutinib and less, uh, not really much about idelalisib. It's there for relapsed disease, um, but it does have some toxicities. So we are very careful using it. Um, then venetoclax came along and acalabrutinib. Um, as I mentioned, younger patients um, may be eligible at relapse um, to get a stem cell transplant. And more um, recently is a treatment that's not yet available. It's undergoing clinical trials of CAR T cell. Next. So this is one of the earlier studies um, with uh, immunochemotherapy. Uh, so that's the rituximab was added to fludarabine and cyclophosphamide in fit patients. And you can see it was um, almost 100% had a response. Um, and it was a land breaking um, publication in 2010, adding rituximab um, improved the overall results. Um, and um, that's continued to be a theme with chemotherapy. Next. 
Here's um, the trial of CLL8, and these are the results. Pro pro um, progression free survival is the main thing we look at in clinical trials. This is the period of time before you relapse again. So you can see in the green line, this is the uh, group that has rituximab added to the chemotherapy. This, the blue is without the rituximab. And we usually look at median progression-free survival. So we look at 50% over here and um, follow it along. And um, you can see that uh, the, at the median progression-free survival, the median time before someone relapses is 51.8 months. And then without the rituximab, it was 32.8 months. Next. Very few of our studies um, for CLL treatment show a survival advantage, but adding monoclonal antibody to FC um, did do this. Next. So um, chemoimmunotherapy for first-line treatment, we do have the fludarabine cyclophosphamide rituximab, FCR. We would use that only up to age 65 to 70. The patients have to be fit because of the toxicities. Bendamustine rituximab is for older patients who are fit. Um, chlorambicillin obinutuzumab, older patients who uh, typically are not fit. Next. And this is just outlined, this is efficacy. So how effective are the treatments at the top and below are toxicity? So here's FCR. So almost a median progression free survival around five years. And then the worst is chlorambicil by itself, a median progression free survival of about a year. But the more effective it is, the more toxic it is. Okay. And so here's looking at progression-free survival of the FCR. Um, so we talked about that IGHD mutation. So if you're mutated, it's better. So um, up here is a, a group of patients. So it's probably about 50% of the patients in the study that were mutated and they had good cytogenetics, about 50% of them are still alive and well in remission. And there's talk at meetings whether they are actually cured of their disease. And these would be young, fit patients. And it does show that if they're unmutated, if they've got deletion 11Q, that's the blue line, they don't do as well. Um, and if they've got deletion 17P, and most of these, of course, would be the TP53, they do worse with chemoimmunotherapy. Next. So targeted therapies, um, here's that diagram again. So the ones that we have are, are targeting these enzymes in the CLL cell, BTK, PI3K, and the BCL2. Okay, next. So we have ibrutinib, that was the first, um, the first targeted therapy we had. Um, and we, so that's a BTK inhibitor. Acalabrutinib is uh, now available, um, BTK inhibitor. Idelisib is the, a PI3K inhibitor, and venetoclax is the BCL2 inhibitor. Next. So, this is a study of um, ibrutinib, and that's the one it, that was here first, the first targeted therapy. This is the one we've got the longest follow up. Um, so, this is estimated uh, seven year progression free survival rate was 80%. So at seven years, 80% of people on this drug are still in a remission. They haven't relapsed yet. Um, the thing about this targeted therapy, um, ibrutinib, is you need to stay on it indefinitely. The yellow is first line treatment. The purple is, sec is uh, relapsed disease. So um, it's just showing that if you use ibrutinib, in first line, it has a, a, it's more effective than when you use it in relapsed disease. One of the downsides of these drugs that you have to stay on indefinitely is that they have side effects. So um, uh, at, at the um, around 70 years, six to seven years, uh, just under 50% of patients um, had stopped the drugs. 
Um, and most of the time it was because of side effects. Next. So recent important clinical trials uh, comparing ibrutinib to chemoimmunotherapy. Um, next. So here the top line is um, uh, uh, ibrutinib, and this was with obinutuzumab, but um, it looks like I, ibrutinib uh, alone is probably uh, just as good. And this is showing that for these high-risk patients, unmutated, deletion 11, deletion uh, 17 and TP53. It, the, the patients do so much better with this targeted therapy than they do with chemoimmunotherapy. In this study, this was the clarambacil and obinutuzumab. Next. So overall survival though is still the same. So it's still a question um, if you start with the ibrutinib at the beginning or if you take it at relapse. Um, what is better because so far the overall survival um, is the same. Next. One of those studies um, was looking at ibrutinib compared to FCR. So this is the younger fit patient group. And this is showing that IGHV status again. So if they're unmutated, the red line is, is ibrutinib. So they definitely did better than FCR if they were unmutated. But if they were mutated, they still are the same. So we didn't see the advantage of ibrutinib in this good group. Next. This study did show an overall survival advantage, which was, sur which was surprising. Uh, I think time will, will tell us if this is a persistent finding. Um, it's early days in follow-up. And um, there were just very few uh, deaths. So I think it's early to say, but, but this is uh, what the study showed. Uh, something about adverse events. So with ibrutinib, um, we were seeing atrial fibrillation, which is not a typical side effect of, of the um, chemoimmunotherapy and um, low counts and um, sore joints was seen. Uh, in, um, and serious um, side effects um, seen in about 11% or less in first line. Bleeding was another unique um, side effect. Hypertension, and it um, seemed that hypertension um, was highest in the years three to six, but we'll see what happens in long-term follow-up. Um, serious infection incurred up in about a quarter of the patients and this little diagram over on the left is just showing side effects as the years go on. Most of the side effects, as, as time goes on, they're less. Um, and again, this is a drug that you're staying on continuously. So there is an expectation there will be some side effects. Infection is here and um, it continues to be an issue over time. Next. Second generation BT BTK inhibitors. Um, and this is acalabrutinib. So the side effects of ibrutinib, um, it was questioned whether it's the BTK effect um, on other tissues, because BTK is in other organs, other tissues. Acalabrutinib is the new kid on the block. It is more targeted, um, so possibly less, less side effects, but these studies are still early, so we're not quite sure about that. So there's Elevate um, TN, first-line treatment, and ascend um, for relapsed refractory CLL next. And just a word about Elevate. So here's a calibrutinib with, with or without a monoclonal antibody. And it definitely, like ibrutinib, these patients are doing better than obinutuzumab and chlorambacil. And uh, that median progression free survival in the uh, a calibrutinib group has not been reached yet. But this is a median follow up of. To 28 months, so just over two years, still early. Next. And then, um, so the question about toxicity, um, headache seems to be a common side effect with a calibrutinib unique to that drug. Um, seems to be mild, uh, seems to go away with acetaminophen uh, and uh, caffeine and only lasts a few days in most cases, but it's, it's somewhat unique. And then diarrhea, 
is a side effect of many drugs, um, but this is also seen with um, acalabutinib. Next. And um, of interest would be the atrial fibrillation. So um, in these columns are the two arms that had acalabrutinib. So a lower um, incidence than with the ibrutinib, but again, we need um, more follow-up to see if that's true. And bleeding, um, serious bleeding would be down here, grade three or more, and that's low. And hypertension did, um, is low in, in the acalabrutinib. Next. Um, this was just presented this summer at the, at the European um, uh, Hematology Association meeting. And this is in relapse with the refract refractory disease with the acalabrutinib. But again, you're seeing the high-risk patients, deletion 17P, TP53. Um, they do better with acalabrutinib. These arms were, were BR or idelalisib and rituximab. And here's unmutated, still did better with the acalabrutinib. Um, and of course, we need uh, um, longer follow up, but you can see that the arm, two, two arms diverge very early. Thanks. Next. So, venetoclax um, is uh, now available for relapsed disease. And there were a couple of studies, Murano, and then more recently, CLL14 trial, venetoclax with obinutuzumab in first line treatment. Um, and, and I'm happy to say that we participated in Halifax on this study. Thanks. Next. So it is a targeted therapy, but the advantage to venetoclax is it's time limited. Um, in these studies, it was either one year or two years and then stopped. Um, it, it seems to be the most effective treatment for relapsed CLL. If you've already had another targeted therapy before, it's effective in clearing the blood and bone marrow CLL cells. And, and so there's, um, you'll see in the venetoclax study, this um, term undetected minimal residual disease. And they, that seems to be, a, to be well correlated with how long your remission will last. Um, a concerning toxicity is what we call tumor lysis syndrome. So it's a drug that acts so quickly that you just get this overwhelming um, re release of contents of the killed leukemia cells and those um, that the cell debris has to go out the kidneys. So it's a, a, it's a challenge for the kidneys and there can be an electrolyte imbalance. So for some, some patients, Starting venetoclax, if you think they're high risk, they do need hospitalization. Next. Um, and this was the CLL14 trial, again, just showing the advantage of a targeted therapy over um, obinutuzumab and chloramicil. And the median follow up, again, was just over two years. Next. Um, just a reminder that when you, a timeline, when you get a drug from a clinical trial, um, there's the trial, um, usually takes a number of years to get to the randomized phase three trial, has to get published. Only then will Help Canada or the P-coder and Ness in Quebec look at the results and see if they think they should approve the drug in Canada. Then it goes to the provincial departments of health to see if they'll pay for it. Um, usually your health insurance won't pay for it until the Department of Health has approved it. There might be a compassionate program like acalabrutinib right now, where the drug has been approved by Canada and we're waiting for the provinces to pay for it. And always you should consider a clinical trial if one's available. And first, so just first line treatment. Um, if you've got the 17P deletion or the TP53, um, everyone would agree um, you need a targeted therapy. Uh, the one that we have right now is ibrutinib. Acalabrutinib is just available now um, on the compassionate program. 11-teen-Q um, deletion seems to be also a risk factor that you would do better with um, ibrutinib or acalabrutinib. Um, that mutational status, unmutated, you may do better um, with ibrutinib or acalabrutinib. If you're mutated and you're young and fit, I think it still stands that you uh, should be considered for FCR because that's the group that we have the, the long survivors 
Um, and soon to come, we'll be even at a class in obinutuzumab for first line therapy and challenging to know where that fits in. So um, chemoimmunotherapy, if you're fit under 65 to 70, FCR fit over 65, BR unfit or older, um, claramicil and obinutuzumab. In next, so relapse CLL, if you got chemoimmunotherapy first line, ibrutinib, acalabrutinib, idelalisib, and rituximab or venetoclax and rituximab are now available in Canada. If you got ibrutinib or acalabrutinib first line, probably the, your best bet would be to go to venetoclax and rituximab next. Ongoing trials, I'll just finish here, um, looking at combinations of venetoclax and ibrutinib, FCR and ibrutinib, and so far, these are looking very promising with no unexpected uh, toxicity. Um, some PI3K new inhibitors um, and some new monoclonal antibodies, looking at combinations, looking at that unmutated, um, or sorry, um, uh, the um, minimal residual disease um, being undetectable, undetected and, and using that as a benchmark to stop treatment, uh, trying to find a way not to have um, targeted therapy um, with um, ongoing treatment until you relapse next. So that's it. Sorry for the rush there, I'm trying to catch up. Um, hopefully we've got a little time for questions. Yeah, we still have a few minutes, no rush for um, some questions. So if anyone does have a question, if you just type it in the Q&A box, we can read it out. Um, so we do have a couple here. So um, after a first line treatment of a brutinib for unmutated CLL, what other options would there then be? Right, so right now we do have approval of venetoclax and rituximab, um, and that has been shown to be, um, to give good results after someone's had targeted therapy on brutinib in first line. Um, the thing in Canada is, every province approves the drugs um, at different rates. So I know that Nova Scotia recently approved it for uh, venetoclax rituximab for, for relapse disease. I'm not 100% sure that it's um, approved in every province in Canada. Okay, we have another question here. Um, this person writes that they have, their, uh, they have CLL, they're currently um, doing watch and wait. And they've also been put on, part of my pronunciation of this drug, hydroxyurea. Um, wants to know if this medication can have any sort of side effect on their CLL. Right. Okay. Um, so hydroxyurea, we usually use it for lowering a white count. It doesn't um, Usually with CLL, um, the patients can have very high white counts, like several hundred. And because those little CLL cells are so small, they don't, um, they don't uh, cause problems with the circulation. So, so you, most of the time we don't use hydroxyurea because um, we aren't overly worried about the high white count we would use those other indications I talked about to treat. So um, it, I'm not quite sure um, why you're on hydroxyurea. It, it would need to bring the white cap down. So I guess you um, could have that conversation. Um, we, yeah. Um, another question. Um, they say there's no mention of the 13Q deletion with unmutated. Does this status have any effect on your choice of treatment? Right. Um, thanks for bringing that up. So the so fifty five percent of people have thirteen Q, um, and that's considered a good risk. The majority of those people would be mutated, um, but some would be unmutated. 
So what I don't think we have a good grasp on with all the literature is that if you've got um, a bad one or one that would um, say you might do better with a targeted therapy and then a good one that says you might do better with chemoimmunotherapy, I'm not sure that we know what to do. I think the mutational status in most cases, it looks like it trumps. So if you're unmutated, uh, we probably would go uh, or consider a targeted therapy, even if you were 13 q Okay, we have another one. Um, is there an identified treatment protocol for patients who have developed PLL, a rare subset of CLL? Is there an identified protocol? Yeah, is there a, a, an existing treatment protocol? Yeah. Um, that is a tough one. So that's prolymphocytic leukemia. Um, and it, it is quite rare. I mean, there are different protocols. They're different than for CLL. Um, but uh, again, it, it, it's pretty, it would be rare and it would be very specific to your disease. So it, yeah be hard to generalize. Okay. Um, we have another question about the side effects of a brute nib. Uh, I know you mentioned quite a few of them. They just wanted to know if skin rashes were also uh, a common side effect to expect. I would say definitely. That's one of the more common ones with ibrutinib. It, it, it's also one of the ones that in follow-up, it looks like the, that um, the likelihood of getting it for on, further on down the road is less. And it's also one that seems to improve over time. So um, oftentimes you can just go through with antihistamines or, or something local for the skin. If it's bad enough, um, it, it might be that the, the dose of ibrutinib would be um, lowered and then eventually it could be increased back to, to where it was. Um, it would be a, a less common um, side effect that would require people to stop ibrutinib, but, but rash is recognized with ibrutinib. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions um, we've got in so far. We did run a little bit over time. So thank you so much, Dr. Robinson, for making time for this today. This was a very informative presentation. We're so grateful for you for taking time for us today. Um, if anyone does have any further questions, you can always email them in to us at info at lymphoma.ca and we will get back to you with those ones.